uh, I'm planning to have a uh, guest speaker to uh, give us a talk uh, on the topic of how to reduce number of training samples for the deep learning. Uh, it will be early December. So uh, I, I'm contacting the um, SD office to make announcement. So just for the heads up, it will be one of the time in maybe first week of December. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, another thing is, um, uh, if you are thinking to uh, using this deep learning in one of your projects, then uh, I want to know whether maybe it's making sense we could invite the uh, maybe leadership Bob or someone show up in one of the review sessions, then it will be an open discussion on the on our needs and you know basically just um, just everyone discuss what they want to do with it or what's uh, still needed. It, it's more like uh, getting the attention than uh also show that you know there are some meaningful projects we can do so if you think that's a good idea then please let me know any anyone have any comments sounds good yeah but do you guys have anything you want to want to do? You know, really, you have a project or data sites or something. Uh, maybe you will build a model on for it. You know, then it's getting more interesting. So, Huey, are we are we going to have a, an opportunity to maybe talk to you or some other experts on how to set that up if we want to do our own project? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm uh, always open. Just send me an email. We can, we can talk. Certainly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Cool. So yeah, that's two things. So today we will um, look at one of these uh, assignment question. Um, basically, build a, a close to real uh, convolutional neural net uh, for a segmentation problem. So this model we will build is called UNITE. It's very popular in segmentation and also very effective. It's a practical type of model which you can use in your in deployment in products. So what it's doing is something like this. Uh, I found one uh, Kaigo computation on this topic. It's called Kavana car segmentation. So. You know this Kavana is this new way of uh, sell your cars. Uh, it, they exist uh, in the in Bethesda. So you know you have those buildings which fill with cars. That's this Kavana. So what they do is four years ago they sponsored the Kaigo for this competition. Then uh, they organized uh, quite a lot of this kind of car picture on different angles. Then they got people to manually segment them like this. Uh, then the task is can we design a neural network to create the auto segmentation of these car models? Okay. Uh, if you are interested, uh, if you go to Kaigo site, they ha still have this. Uh, competition online. It's of course uh, closed a long time ago, but uh, first price $25,000. So if you are good at this, then I know people even making a living by doing this kind of competition. Um, if you go to Kaigo, you can download all the data sites, even in here data. Uh, after um, you register account, then you can download that. Uh, for this um, um, assignment purpose, I already downloaded them, then organized them a little bit. Okay. So the model we will build um, is showing in this picture. So let me explain this. This may look like a little bit formidable, but uh, it's uh, not actually. Um, 
So let's say you have a car models, car image, uh, which they have the original image with pretty big size. So I reduce the size, uh, then we can uh, train it in reasonable time. So it's a RGB image. Therefore, we have uh, three channels here. The image height is 112 pixels. Image width is 168 pixels. So by following the PyTorch convention, you have batch channel, then height and width, right? So the input will be in this size of tensor. Uh, this model is called a unit in the way that uh, it has this shape of U. So uh, in general, it's consisting of this uh, down sample branch, down branch and the up branch. So what this uh, uh, model do is you have your inputs, you go through a bunch of uh, convolution uh, batch norm ReLU layers. Uh, then at some step, you reduce the image resolution. Uh, for example, here we use a thread two convolution. So we discussed this uh, on Wednesday. You can reduce image resolution by half, uh, let's say. Then this image goes through batch ReLU count, batch ReLU count. Um, uh, at all this uh, uh, blue box, you keep the image resolution unchanged. Uh, then it's go to another layer, you reduce resolution again. Um, so at the same time, so if you look at this uh, block, it gave you 64 output channels, uh, but here it's increased the output channel. So the basic concept of uh, convolutional neural net is you reduce spatial resolution, then you increase number of feature map, okay? Uh, Hui, what's, can you say again, what's uh, the BN layer? It's batch now. Okay. So last time we discussed right. that right. batch now. Um, so then we re uh, increase spatial resolution. Uh, then here we, uh, no, reduce spatial resolution, increase number of feature map. And here we reduce again, then uh, actually we keep it uh, for a reason I, uh, I will explain. Then on the up sample layer, you can up sample the image. Uh, for example, using the um, PyTorch interpolation layer, which we, we discussed last time. Uh, this up sample layer, you, you keep the number of uh, feature map the same and up sample the number of um, uh, the spatial resolution, okay? Then you keep going, go through the uh, convolution layer, then up sample again. So you reduce resolution three times and up sample three times. So finally, in the end, um, basically we go back to original resolution, okay? Then, so Hui, would, would you consider every blue little box to be a layer or is each like blue, yeah, each all is of those a layer. together a layer? Uh, depends on your, um, your terminology. So each of these blue box in PyTorch is a layer. It's a, that one of the layer layer call. Okay. You can implement all of them as a module. Then that's become a, a bigger layer, deeper layer, including a number of steps. So okay. oh, what I'm talking is we down sample three times and up sample three times. Okay. Okay. So one thing uh, different is um, consider this, this, this module, you have the input, then input is actually bypass all these layers and added to the outputs. So this is called the residue connection. Um, the one of the advantages, if you have a gradient flow flow here, then it can go through this all the way um, into the input. So by adding the this residual connection, it's enabled the model to go very deeper. So we will talk this idea. It's a key idea of right night um, in the next lecture, okay? So one design pattern in the current convolutional neural net is uh, you often like to add in a, a bunch of this uh, uh, rather local localized residual connection. So your gradient flow can just flow over if it's a uh, model decided it is, okay? The second thing different on this model is it has this, uh, this connection, it's called a scape connection. 
So basically, when you get the image in, it goes through a comm layer, then model have choice that sending the information directly to the apps instead of go through all of this, uh, these deeper layers. So you have space, a uh, skip connection at every resolution level, okay? Here and here. So that's the key uh, innovation in this UNET model by adding this skip connection. The uh, one advantage is now you give the model freedom to choose what it will do at different resolution level. So maybe um, it will sending some information at the original resolution, then sending some information over at the reduced resolution. So you may have some image feature which better detect at different resolution, different scale. So this resolution mm -hmm. level is often called scale. Yeah, go on. I got a lot of questions. I mean, you're you're using all these terms. I have no idea what you mean by resolution. I mean, the image size is one thing. Oh yeah, yeah. What I mean is actually, um, so let's say your image pixel size pixel size is one millimeter uh, at this uh, one one two matrix size. So you down sample it, then every pixel become two millimeter. So that's what I mean resolution. It, uh, what I actually mean is uh, image image size. So you're starting out with a, a certain image number of, of inputs based on this 112 by 168? Yeah. And then what is con 5 by 5 is the size of the kernel? What is 32? 32 is output channels. So oh. you have the three channel in, 32 output channel out. What does that mean? So um, last time we have that, uh, you know, you have convolution, you have, uh, uh, so you can have uh, a, a number of convolution kernels in, in one convolution operation, right? So- You use 32, you mean you use 32 different kernels, is that what you mean? Yes. Then oh, okay. every kernel generates a feature map, then you have 32 of it. Right, right. I'm, but I had no idea. You're using, you're starting to say 32 channels. I never heard them called channels. I thought before we were talking about different feature maps. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's uh, actually what I mean, the uh, same thing here. Um, so and then you do something with a stride too that reduces the, the number of yes uh, so, feature uh, values in each feature map. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so um, th that's the purpose. So what this design is, is, is doing this. Um, so for example, at this, this uh, after this COM layer, we will decide we don't, we don't want to change image size, okay? So after this COM layer, you will have a ten tensor outputs. Basically will be batched by uh, 32 by 112 by 168. So let's say this count layer has padding of two and stride one. So if I don't say in stride, it means stride is always one by default. So you have an image after this count layer, you have this tensor size, okay? Okay. Then this uh, tensor size goes through this layer. So it goes through a batch now, which doesn't change image size, tensor size then go through a ReLU, which doesn't change the tensor size. Then you go through a convolution layer, which uh, gave you a 64 feature map as output and a stride of two. So now yeah, the, the tensor size become a batch size by 64 by um, 56 by 64. Okay. Okay, then this uh, tensor goes through this uh, six layers, uh, batch norm, relu, conf, batch norm, relu, conf. It's keeping the 64 feature map. So the tensor size here is uh, still batch by 64 by 56 by 64. Okay. Yeah. Then we go through another uh, stride two convolution, but this time we increase the feature map to 128. So size here will be batch by 128 by uh, 28 by 32. 
Okay. Then uh, we keep going. This layer doesn't change image size because we set them padding, proper padding and uh, stride as one. So you can do that. Then here, um, you still keep the image size. So batch by 128 by 28 by 32, okay? Yeah. So we go through another stride two convolution. Then uh, what we will have, we, we, are, we are still generate 128 feature map. So we will be batch by 128 by 28 by 32, okay? Then this tensor goes through all these layers, doesn't change its size. But now here we go through an up sample by two the interpolation layer. So the tensor size here will be batched by 128 by 56 by 64, okay? You're doubling the size of the feature map, of each of the feature maps. Why would you ever want to do that? Um, Uh, what do you, uh, well, like what, what's, uh, the, what's the motivation? Uh, the motivation is this. Uh, so you increase the space, uh, reduce the matrix size, right? Uh, then uh, you maybe want your network to be very expressive. So you can, one way to, you can keep how many feature you keep is to increase number of feature might. So basically, yeah. um, you reduce the spatial size, but go depths in the, go deep on the feature dimension. So if we, the, is the reason for the upsampling um, steps, is it to, so that at the end you get an image that the same size as the original one, because we're doing segmentation? Yeah, that, that's correct. Okay. Because you, you, you want the outputs to be same as the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, same pixel on um, pixel wise, the same as the inputs. So that's why you do it. Okay. But uh, this design also want to uh, utilize, the, um, uh, want to utilize, basically you can detect different feature better on different uh, scale of the image. So maybe some feature, um, so you could first uh, detect a blow at a rather low resolution. Then uh, upper layer could give you more details. So. Um, uh, it, it's like uh, um, uh, it's like uh, it's like by level detection. Uh, what I mean is, uh, you come to a, a object. If you're far away, you maybe just say it's a uh, uh, plan, Then you get closer. Then you can see more details. So this network is kind of doing that. On the lower resolution layer, it's uh, level. It's try to uh, find, um, it's try to find the, the you know, the upline of the object. So maybe it's saying here is a car. Then on the upper layer, it will uh, uh, detect all all the fine, finer details in the car. So that's what this uh, this model is trying to do. Is the is the final uh, thing of this whole thing going to be a a type of car? That is, what is it going to do? Is it classify the type of car? Is it going to draw a picture? No, no, no. It's going to generate one of these masks for you. So every pixel, it will give you. So I actually it matches. Like it, it match. It's matching a car to a profile picture. Yes. Yes. So your final output will be because it's binary classification. So your final will actually have only one channel. For every pixel, it will be the probability. Uh, actually, yeah, uh, after we go through a, a sigmoid, it will be the probability of that pixel belonging to that car. So your final will be batched by one by 112 by 168. It has so, to determine which cars. Which not which car. car. So uh, actually, let me go here. Um, uh, so in this assignment, uh, uh, the data is on this zip. So firstly, you need to do is unzip it. Um, uh, I will actually not let this stop. 
uh, finish, but because it's a lot of image, but let's stop here. It's enough for the purpose. So if you go to every folder, it has a, um, uh, actually maybe we need to unzip a little bit more. Um, give me a few seconds. So you're given a bunch of car pictures and a bunch of profiles. Each one has a profile that you're given the training data set. Yeah, you gave a bunch of uh, cars like this, pictures. Right. Then uh, your label will be the same size, black and white image. All the car pixel is one, then background is zero. So that's basically our label. Okay, and then on the testing, it's gonna, it has to determine if it's really correct that that's the, actually the profile of the, of the car? Yes, so for example- um, Some of them will be wrong? Some of the training data set will be incorrect? Oh, uh, no, 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 it's not a classification problem. It's segmentation problem. So. Your input will be uh, this picture on the left. So it give you a car image. Then your, your, your output of this model will be this uh, segmentation mask. So well, basically- you know, I thought you said that was the, in, that was the label input. Uh, in the training, this is uh, X and Y. So that's your labels. But uh, after you train the model, you do the testing, you, you basically give the model a, a, a picture like that. Then this model will generate you a segmentation mask like this. It's, it's gonna have to create its own picture? Yes, everything in fine detail, very accurate. That's almost like magic of this deep learning. Uh, it's working better than any other segmentation technique ever invented. Okay, you know, so the label is actually okay. So the label itself is is all the pixels of this black and white picture. Yes, and it's got to it's got to determine all those. Okay, yeah. So that's how it does it. Yeah. Um, so one thing I need to talk is this loss function. So. Uh, for this, so now you have a picture, right, uh, as your input. So uh, what this loss function will do is for every pixel, it's a binary classification problem. So for every pixel model needs to give a probability that this pixel belong to car or belong to background, right? So we learned this uh, cross entropy loss for the binary classification. So what this loss doing is for every pixel, it's compute one cross entropy loss, then basically take the sum in for the other pixels, uh, actually take a mean for all the pixels. Uh, so that's, we, yeah, go on. So the, the units, uh, are they only used in situations where your output needs to be the same size as your input, like a segmentation? No, 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 no. you can, you can, or... nothing, nothing is magic here, right? You could change things. Um, you could- uh... wonder, To me, to me, uh, the upsampling step only makes sense if you, if you want your output to be- Yeah, definitely, definitely. Right? You don't need to. Uh, otherwise... I, otherwise you could, uh, you could you don't need this branch so for many uh, classification network we will they will say they could reduce pixels image size then finally uh, go to some uh, uh, basically just convolve it better then go to some fully connector layer give you a class probability out then for those you don't need to recover spatial resolution at all so what you put here really depends on your needs yeah. Uh, but some pattern remains like this uh, residue connection. Um, uh, so in the early days when people design network, they, 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 um, uh, they, they can be fancy on this convolution. Uh, but uh, generally uh, these days, um, 
the consensus you could keep the network rather deep and keep the convolution very simple, like three by three or five by five. Um, then if your network is deep enough, then deeper layer actually will look at the very big region in the original image, right? So you just let the network figure out instead of be fancy on, um, you know, tune this, uh, what's the kernel size, all this stuff. Um, so, but that's that's one one design's um, uh, this space preference. So another is we will show uh, I think next lecture. So you can even got a mechanism to search how 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 many convolution layers, uh, how many types, all this stuff. Then uh, it's end up some uh, machine design network, uh, which actually worked a lot better so given. Uh, it, it's a uh, number of parameters. It's actually worked a lot better than human intuitive design. So that's actually, it's uh, efficient night um, from Google, which is quite popular these days. Um, yeah, so that's basically some uh, networks. So quick question, is this a typical unit for se segmentation? Are, are most of them like this, or is this very specific for this example? It's a pretty typical. Uh, in, in the original UNET paper, they don't have this residue connection, but you can, oh, the basic concept, you get these basic concepts, right? So down sample layer, you reduce resolution, increase number of features. Up sample, you do the, you do the opposite. Then you adding some skip connection to link different uh, down sample and up sample. So that's basic idea of UNET. Then what you're putting into this every layer is totally uh, flexible. You can put many different things, um, but one typical way is to add in this uh, local, you know, ResNet type modules. Got it. And the skip connections, are those uh, that typical as well or? And yes, that, that's that's very typical. So if you don't adding this, then the performance will go down. So if you don't adding this big, big scape connection, then it's it's not a U shape stuff. It's really just uh, uh, one end in, the other end out, right? That's it. Yeah, right. Okay, cool. So uh, I want to show you this. Uh, uh, this assignment code a little bit. Um, so it's in this assignment three A three unit uh, file, which uh, is more or less close to a. Uh, if you do one of your own project, it, it's the scale is close to one uh, a, a full featured uh, network. So let's basically just go through it. Um, so I can put a breakpoint here in the main function then I can let it run. Okay. So um, uh, just, just be clear, we always do this. So I run this uh, command, uh, then it's going to the main function. So first thing it's doing is uh, find its current moment, which is today and this moment. Then if you try the weights and the bias, this one if you initial a project in weights and bias. Uh, I like to tag things with uh, the moment I do the experiment. So basically it will um, connect to weights and bias then uh, just starting it. Uh, then we go to this run training driving function. So if we step into it, uh, this configuration is basically some default parameters. Uh, so like we can say it, uh, how many epochs, how many batch size learning rates, which optimizer we use, what's the IL2 weight decay, whether we want to use GPU or not, okay? Uh, nothing too special, but this line will uh, tell weights and bias, this is my uh, running parameters, so weights and bias will record this information. So uh, here is just uh, uh, 
a good practice in the way you you make sure everything is correct. Yeah, correctly recorded. Okay. Uh, then we uh, um, the data is in the data folder in the so if you go to this homework assignment three data, then uh, you have the training image in the train folder, then training mask. So basically the Y, which is binary mask in this mask folder. Um, as you can see, it's all this uh, black and white image. Uh, and the test image is in a uh, test folder and the test mask because we want to compute some metrics, how, how good the segmentation is. So this one, basically you just tell it where is the training folder, where is the mask folder uh, and for test. Then we can go to this function, which basically set up that high charge data set and the loaders, okay. So if you step into it, uh, firstly, we add some uh, data augmentation. So in this case, we only add a random flip along first dimension of the image and the random flip along second dimension of the image. Then you basically declare a PyTorch data site uh, by giving where is the image. So training data and the training mask and the transformation, okay. That's what we discussed last time on how to do the data augmentation in PyTorch. So if you go into this data site, uh, it's, it's, it's in this, uh, uh, where is it? Oh, here, Kawana data site.py. So this class is derived from PyTorch data set. So remember what PyTorch data sets require is you implement a lens function and you implement an item, get item function. Uh, in general, you want to have a initial function. So uh, here, what I do is in the initial, I give the folder to store the training image and give the folder to store the mask, okay? So in the, um, uh, initial function, actually what I do is I just uh, uh, go through into the image list how many, how many objects in there, okay? Um, so what, what we really loaded is this NumPy file for every image, but I also keep a bitmap picture so we can visualize them easier. So what this plan doing is find all the files which ended with NumPy. So let's uh, stop here. So we have uh, uh, 4,816 samples. Then we basically want to load every one of them. So this line will give you a, a progress bar. So TQDM is very nice Python package to adding this progress bar into your code. So if I do it, you can see here is a progress bar is initial. Uh, the total is four, 4816. Then for every image, uh, every file list in this folder, okay? If it's ending with a NumPy, NPY extension, I know it's a NumPy file, then uh, this if will be true, we get in here. Uh, we find the files full pass then if this file actually exists, then we basically call NumPy load that, okay? Um, so the assumption is for every image file, we have a corresponding mask file. So I just basically load the mask as well. Um, this image will be 112 by 168 by three channels. And the mask will be 112 by 168 because it's a black white, it's a single channel image. Then uh, this image and the mask basically it's a list. So I basically just uh, uh, append this current sample into my buffer. But um, one thing it's doing is try to transpose. So image is a uh, height by weight by channel, but PyTorch convention is channel by height by weight. 
So I basically transpose the channel dimension to be first. That's where this one is, okay? So then I just record how many I loaded. Um, so I put a stop point here. You will see this progress bar is totally loaded. So that's what this code is. Okay, cool. Um, so remember we have this beta pre-processing um, we discussed. So here I use the simplest beta pre-processing. I basically um, just, uh, um, for every image in this buffer, uh, it's basically just take its max. So every image is compressed to zero to one, no matter what it's, uh, uh, original value is, okay. Uh, then that's it, that's its function. Uh, then in, um, so we load this uh, data sets. So if we call this print, so in this class, we actually implement a, uh, this uh, string function, that's a PyTorch building function. So it will be automatically called if you print this object. So give you a chance to add in some meaningful information. So what I added here is just list how many image, how many mask, uh, do we have a transformation, image shape, mask shape, this kind of information. So I can return this string then it will print. So basically it will print here, okay? That's uh, in the way a good practice to, um, so a good practice to check every step, make every step is correct before you actually go into the training. So we, we, we do the same thing for a test. Um, all right. Ah, uh, maybe I went too too fast. So, uh, in this uh, code, if you click the oh, sorry, click this function, then hmm. okay, let's start again. So we load the training site, then we load the test site. Okay, so now uh, I have my training site. So I got uh, how many sample in my training site? It's 4,48.16. So I split them uh, by split it into um, 512 validation and uh, the rest is training. So basically split the data index. Uh, before I do splitting, I first shuffle the data, so all the data will be shuffled. Um, then for every index, I call this PyTorch loader. So uh, I'm using this uh, sampler, so you can give it specific index, which, which sample will be used for training and which sample will be used for validation. And this number of workers is uh, tell PyTorch how many threads it wants to use to load the data. So when you do the training, uh, data loading is often done in CPU and uh, training is done in GPU. So they could be done in parallel. So the idea is you, if you give enough CPU power, then when the GPU is done one mini batch, the, the data is already loaded and pre-processed. So all, including the random transformation they apply. Uh, so sometimes um, people can apply rather complicated uh, random transformation. Uh, that's why um, they design this. You can do it uh, in multi threads. Okay. So then we create loaders. Uh, for the test loader, you don't need to do anything this fancy because, uh, in general, on the test, you don't want to do any data augmentation. 
Okay, so uh, any questions on this part? But why you don't want to do data augmentation in test? You want, I thought like rotation and adding some noise is known as data augmentation. Yeah, so on the test, your assumption is test data sets reflects your, your real world situation. So that's, uh, you want to know that performance. You don't need to make that more, more uh, harder or anything. Um, when you do the training, you can add some data augmentation. So when you do the training model, we will see different uh, transformed samples. So maybe it behave better on the test scenario. So that's why on the test, you don't, in general, you, you never apply any random transformation. Okay. But unless you have a reason that uh, your test set is already simplified, you want to make it harder. Uh, right. Okay, cool. So um, uh, it's a good practice after you load the data, you check that. So if I um, check the first sample in my training site, um, then uh, this is the correct size. Just make sure it's correct. Then I will go to declare this. Uh, let's look at the bigger structure of this code. So you declare your model then you declare your loss function. Then uh, according to um, which optimizer we use, you declare your optimization, either uh, in this case, item or uh, SGD. Uh, then we can declare a uh, uh, learning rate scheduler, which we all discussed. Then later you can check, okay, do I have CUDA? Do I have GPU on this computer? Um, Uh, then you can call the training training loop. So uh, we, we will step into this function to say the to say the real training loop. Okay. So after you train a model, uh, you have your best best model in M. Then you can take it and uh, test the data sets to compute a uh, test loss, test accuracy. Then these lines actually log your accuracy and uh, loss into uh, weights and bias. So the final step is uh, what, what I like to do is actually apply the model on some, uh, on one batch of the test image, then save them. Um, so you got one batch of test image X, Y, then you compute Y hat. That's that uh, um, model outputs, uh, which is logits in this example. Then you call a uh, PyTorch Sigma to convert logits into probability then it, we can plot probability as some pictures, then save them. So after training, we will say, um, uh, you really should look like uh, the probability really mimic your, your labels. So we will get there. So that's basically the bigger picture of this code, okay? So let's go into these models. Um, if you uh, step into it, so model is in this uh, uh, unit model.py, okay. So, um, so this model is uh, a bit more um, full-scaled in the way that um, firstly you derive from PyTorch modules, that's most model it derived from. Um, then, um, in the initial part, you give some model parameters. What's my operational uh, image size? So height and weight and the channel. Channel will be three. So what we will do is uh, basically implement that picture. So let's look at it. We have the input convolution channel, which is uh, whatever number of input channels, which is three. Then we want 32 channel outputs and we want kernel size five and we want stride one, and we want the padding is two, which means uh, you are not changing the image, uh, you're basically not changing the image size. And you have choice whether you want to uh, have the a bias term for this convolution. So if you move the mouse here, you can say, um, or maybe, yeah. 
Okay, so so the maybe it's a remote computer. So normally you right click, you can see the definition of this uh, these layers. So but anyway, we define a convolution layer. Then uh, we we define a down sample layer. Okay, so this down sample is uh, was defined in a class. So let's uh, step into it. So down sample is uh, defined a module. So what the way PyTorch works is PyTorch gave you a bunch of layers, but you can combine them or define your own layer. The only constraint is you, you basically derive from this NN module class. So here we design a down sample block. So what this thing doing is uh, um, uh, yeah, it's, this is another thing. So in PyTorch, they have not only layers, but also some containers to contain different layers to make this uh, uh, coding easier. So one container is called sequential. If you're adding a bunch of layers to it, then you can call this block uh, as this. Uh, what this uh, sequential will do is basically just call first layer, then give its outputs to second layer here, give it outputs to the third. So whatever, how many modules in your sequential container, okay? So we declare a sequential container. Then firstly, we add a batch norm, as that figure showed. Then we add a ReLU. Then we add a uh, convolutional layer. Because we want to downsample, so here you have strat equals two, okay? And you can specify how many input channel and output channel, kernel size. Uh, we made the padding as kernel size divided by two, so we are not, uh, the convolution itself won't change the image size. We will only use stride to change the image size, okay? Uh, and here, so this is uh, that he initialization. So this author was called the Kaiming He. So in PyTorch, the people implement this Kaiming normalization to initial your weights. Um, if you put a nonlinear array as ReLU, then it will do that, uh, give an extra scale factor of two, uh, as we discussed in previous lecture. So that's exactly that, okay? Then um, let's say we design, design the first down sample layer, down sample block. Uh, so we go back. So we're adding this down sample block. Now you will add this ResNet block, okay? So let's go to in this block. So this is another composed um, module in, in this file. Uh, what it's doing is you do a batch norm ReLU convolution, batch norm ReLU convolution, then put the input added back to outputs. So you have this residue connection. So similarly, we use a sequential container here. Then we're adding batch norm ReLU convolution. Here we have stride one, uh, and the padding is set that we are not changing the feature map size. And batch norm ReLU convolution. So it's a good practice. You name your layer uh, in a more consistent way. So later you can print this model out, then it will help you debug. Uh, and then you can initial some weights. Um, so basically here, what I do is, uh, I only have convolution layer to have weights to initial, right? So batch norm and the ReLU, batch norm has a um, gamma and the beta, but they normally uh, initials uh, to zero, uh, not to zero, to some random number, but normally works. Uh, you don't need to care uh, batch norm. Then ReLU has no learnable parameter. So I actually only initial parameter for two convolutional layers, okay? So that's it. Um, then we go through, we basically adding more down sample layer and rise net layer by, uh, if you're adding down sample, you reduce spatial resolution, uh, but in general, we increase how many um, uh, feature map we, 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 we outputs. So you add three down sample layers, then you can add in the up sample layer. So if we go into this up sample layers, um, 
it's actually very simple. You basically just record, okay, what's my up sample ratio? I want to up sample by two. Then in its forward function, it's literally calling PyTorch interpolation saying I have an input, what's my up sample ratio, which is two, what's my methods. Uh, I just simply use bilinear interpolation. Then make sure the matrix grid aligned. That's, uh, that's as simple as it can be. Then I up sample it. Um, so remember this, uh, uh, this, this connections. So skip connection, it will concate the, uh, two feature maps together. So I will show you what that means. So if you go to the concatenation, this module, okay, you have uh, uh, one input channel, another input channel. So what we will do is, um, in this concat, what you do is uh, count real um, uh, you, you do a batch norm relu then convolution. So we will add that three, batch norm relu convolution. Um, what you do, you have two inputs, adding together and generate outputs. So basically you can cut your two inputs along the channel dimension. So what I mean is if you have an array, let's say 128 by 32 by 64, and the concat, uh, let's say, say with another one, 150, 32 by 64. So, so you're basically adding an array of uh, tensor of 128 plus 150, 32, 64. So you basically just link them along the feature map channels. Okay, that's what I mean, concat. That's what that skip connection do. So you basically take one feature map, add to another feature map, do a concatenation. Okay, so we have one convolution layer. So you basically initial its weights. Um, a little bit different in its forward function is you have now two inputs for that, uh, uh, for this concat, you have one input from down and one input from left. Then you basically first say calling PyTorch concatenation function and your dimension is one to concat. So remember our dimension is batch channel then whatever height weight. Then you basically, this is dimension zero, this is dimension one. So you basically concat along the dimension one. Then after that, you go through this block. So this block is DN relu can off, right? So that's the concatenation. So how you implement this uh, unit concatenation? Um, any, any questions on this part? I'm a little bit confused about the skipping part still. Um, so how do you decide to skip? Like, does it like always skips like that? connection skip connection is always happening or like it's like you you decide yourself so when when you want to skip so a good practice is between the different uh, spatial resolution blocks you skip once you could uh, uh, nothing prevent you to skip in the middle to it it's probably still a valid model will work um yeah that's really your design choice so um the motivation here is if we have this escape connection between different uh, pick, uh, image size, so spatial resolution, then we kind of encourage neural net to utilize them saying, uh, maybe I want to learn some feature from the uh, smaller image size and uh, learn some finer grade feature in uh, you know, higher image size. So that's uh, de your design choice. Uh, okay. to when, when you're adding these skip connections, but the mechanism to adding them is actually what I showed here. So mm -hmm. nothing in secret. You really just call this whatever PyTorch function we have. Then whenever you call a PyTorch function on a PyTorch tensor, if you're adding that piece into your computational graph. So when you do back prop, everything will just be computed automatically and correctly. Okay. 
so that's how you 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 adding uh, that's how you build a big model in the way you you design every parts then you you build every parts as a uh, as one module then you link that okay so that's this up sample layer concatenation layer then rise layer rise block is same as before so we design all these uh, up down samples okay then finally we come to uh, uh, this output layer so basically here so uh, we have the 32 feature map as input, then it will be combined into one output, okay? So one way to do it is you design a convolutional layer, which you have uh, 32 feature map as input, then you only output one. That's it. Um, you keep the image size not changed, then this convolution will take whatever feature map, then just squeeze them into one. Uh, then basically in this whole scheme, uh, in this init function, I, I only explicitly add two layers like convolution 2D and this convolution 2D. So it's my responsibility to initial them here, okay? Um, basically that's it. So you design your model, you, you, you design your model now. So if you do a print, Uh, PyTorch has this built-in function. You actually say everything you design. So that's why you want to name them uh, properly. Then you will have a rather beautiful print saying, okay, my input is uh, including this. Then my down sample is a down sample sequential, which including these layers. Then its k parameter is all listed. So that's very useful when you uh, examine this and debug if things doesn't work. So if you follow a more consistent way to naming everything, then uh, it will be much easier, okay? So that's it. Then we come to the loss function. So uh, if we go into this loss function, um, this class really give you a demo how, how you implement your own loss function. So PyTorch has many loss functions. You can directly call them like in previous assignments. But in sometimes you may want to add your own loss function, some newer equation which no one had built before. So the way you do it is you could just uh, implement this as a class. Then you will implement this underscore call built-in function. Then if your if your Python object call this, it will directly get into this function. Okay. So here what we do is just we, we it's a binary classification problem for every pixel. So we will call PyTorch PCE loss. Uh, then uh, if you look at this call function, what it's doing is it's taking the score. So the model gives you logics, but logics is not probability. So because it's binary classification, we normally go through a sigmoid. So convert everything to zero to one. We take a sigmoid, then you basically give your probability and your labels. So label is a array of zero or one, right? Then this one to a pixel wise BCE loss, binary classification loss, then take a mean by default. So then compress everything to a single value. That's a loss, which is a PyTorch tensor. Even it's a scalar. So what this function do will is uh, it will adding this final loss part into your computational graph. So this loss object, if you do a back probe on it, if you go through the entire graph, then compute all the gradient for you. Okay, so this is a uh, optimizer, this is scheduler, and uh, uh, we do have CUDA, so on this computer. Sorry, we, um, yeah. So you define your own last function here. Does, yeah. Does, uh, did you, did you, def do you have to define your own backdrop? Um, no. So uh, the, the whole thing is you only do forward. So you, you say, I only yeah. add the forward function. Then, the idea is you're adding forward. Uh, if, you, if you operate everything with 
uh, Pytorch function and Pytorch tensor. Then Pytorch uh, behind the scene will record every step you do into a computational graph. So in the end, when you call this loss backward, it will just backward uh, through your graph. So that's why in, in today's um, uh, deep learning framework, you rarely need to define your own back, back prop function. You really just do the forward pass, then let the auto diff handle everything, auto grind. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> yeah, otherwise it'd be very complicated. Uh, if you want to do all these operations. Um, okay, cool. So we are here. Uh, you put uh, all the data in different uh, uh, different type uh, and we uh, uh, basically I define a trainer class. It's really just to contain some member function to compute accuracy or yeah, really just just make this coding cleaner. It could be done as a basic function, but doesn't matter. So oh, one thing, one detail is when you model outputs, it gives you a probability map, right? That's not a mask. Uh, if you want to get a zero or one mask, then um, the simplest way is you give a, just do a threshold. So by default, I put a 0.5 as threshold. So for every pixel, if its probability is bigger than 0.5, I think it's belong to the car. Otherwise it's belong to the background, okay? So- So Huey, is that, yeah. is that just uh, experience on your part? I mean, 0.5 seems pretty, you know, I mean, like a coin flip almost. That's correct. But if your model is really works, then for every pixel in the car, it's almost give you a point 99. This uh, neural net model doesn't uh, mess up things when it works. So then you, you in practice, the thresholding really won't have too much impact on the results. So your background will be so surprised. It's very close to zero and your foreground will be very close to one. It's just work that good. Okay. Then your thread holding actually doesn't matter. So you really, uh, yeah, I, I will show you the trading results. Um, okay, cool. So now we go into this uh, training loop. Um, in the training loop, you can say it's give your input is as model, my loss function, my optimizer, my learning rate scheduler, my loader for data and validation, training and validation. Uh, my loggers, which is a W and B object, uh, my configuration for parameters, okay? So it's all essential for a training loop. Um, then, um, so uh, if you read this PyTorch a little bit, so if you have more than one GPU, you can do this data parallel to uh, using more than one GPU to train. Uh, so the way it's do it is just put your model into this, uh, this wrapper. So this computer has two GPU, so we will uh, just use use all of them. Uh, all the VM you have also have two GPUs. Okay, so we have two GPUs. Then first thing is you move your model to the correct device. So model will be moved to a GPU. Then I declare some kind of empty list to record my loss and accuracy during training and validation. Uh, and I keep a copy of the best model I ever can have. Uh, the way I select the best model is I track the best uh, validation accuracy. Okay. That, that's the simplest way to do it. Then people have different ways. So then for all, every epoch, okay, so we go into the epoch. So what I like to do is for every epoch, I declare a, a, a progress bar. So you know how your training goes. Then remember last time um, you, they said uh, in PyTorch, you have two modes, training mode and evaluation mode. So you, you need to remember if you do the training, put the model into training mode. Uh, then we have some running loss and accuracy just uh, compute, record that. Then uh, let's 
this is just for timing. Then for every for this for this epoch, we go through every mini batch. So if you iterate through a pi 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 torch loader, then um, this x this data give you an x and a y for the mini batch. So x will be um, let's do this. X will be batch channel height and weight. So because we set the batch to be 128, so X shape will be this. And Y shape will be batch channel height and weight because Y is a label, a single channel it will be Y. But you have to keep all this, um, all this dimension correct. Um, otherwise uh, the code may complain. Then after you got X and Y, by default, they are on GPU, uh, CPU. So if we're training on G GPU, you have to move them to proper device. Uh, Sometimes convert them into a proper data type, okay? So if this device is CPU, then this, this line will not do anything, only convert data type. Okay, cool. Then um, it's all what we, what we have seen before. You do a forward pass by calling this, then if we step into it. Why? Oh, sorry, I am, uh, oh, we can go back uh, on second, second mini batch to do it. Uh, then we compute the loss function. So you have your y hat. So what's the dimension of y hat? Y hat will be same dimension as y. So, okay, so we, for every every image, um, uh, it will be a binary. Uh, it will be a probability, basically. So you have y as probability, y hat as probability. Then if you go to this loss, uh, uh, sorry, uh, my fault. So y hat is actually logits. So you first convert them into probability. Then you compute a pixel wise binary cross entropy loss. Then take a mean. That's what this uh, whole thing do then give you a loss. That's a torch tensor, even it's a single value. And you can see it has a backprop functions linked, which is uh, because this is directly derived from binary cross entropy. So it's backprop function. It's actually telling you I'm a binary cross entropy backprop. Then this binary cross entropy backprop is linked to a uh, skull function. Then skull function is linked to your entire graph. So that's how this uh, computational graph is totally organized. Okay. Uh, then remember we have a PyTorch by default, it's accumulate gradient. So we need to uh, remember zero gradient. Then you have this uh, L as a tensor, right? So you can do a back prop. So once you do this uh, loss back prop, it will go through the entire computational graph. Um, uh, it's doing exactly the same which we, we, we learned on the third lecture three um, to compute the gradient for all the learnable parameters. So if you just do that, then uh, this optimizer uh, will just uh, change your parameter by one step, okay. Uh, then I have my, um, uh, I basically record my current training loss, training accuracy. So, um, so one thing is how we compute accuracy. So your way to compute accuracy may not be the same as your loss defined. So in this particular case, we will compute accuracy using the dice coefficient. So you remember dice coefficient is uh, a union, uh, no, cross, a and B by right. That's that's the best coefficient. It'd be zero or one. Uh, if two shape is totally overlap, it's one. If it's no overlap, it's zero. So if you go into this, how to compute uh, accuracy, um, the model outputs will be. Uh, 128 by one by this uh, height and weight, your label will be the same shape. So basically you have 128 pictures to compute 
death ratio, right? So what they think do is you take your logic, compute that means the probability, then you apply your threshold. So this Y predict will be one for all the high value pixels, uh, they'll be zero for all the background. Then you declare, um, you know, record all the dice. Then for every 2D image, you compute the dice coefficient once, okay? Then you basically take a mean of all the dice we computed. That's my accuracy. Uh, then you can let the weights and the bias log your loss. And this will progress, this uh, progress bar by one, one step. Um, yeah, you can also set, so change this, uh, this, this, what you print out to be, okay, what's my current loss, this, okay? Then you go to second mini batch. Uh, you do the same thing. Then we need to go into this model forward past. Why it's not go into it? Um, give me one moment. So if we go to this model function, if we put a breakpoint here, yeah. So we go into the forward pass. Your input is a batch of input images. Your outputs will be logics. So what we do is nothing more than go through the network. You go through input convolution, go through down samples, then um, go through the down sample residue block, and uh, keep go through down samples. Uh, but uh, uh, notice I, I record this output of D1, D2 here. Okay, then. One case step is this. So you go to the concatenation function. You basically, uh, this concatenation has two inputs from here and from here. So basically when you go through down sample, you record these outputs. Now you give both inputs into this concatenate layer. So that's why you establish the skip connection in the computational graph. So you do it then Finally, you come to the um, output layer. You have the U3 should be a 32 channel feature map. So let's say U3 shape. Then it will be convolved into one, okay? Um, that's basically it. Then we can let it turn. Uh, so after one epoch, so let's uh, let this thing progress. What is it doing? Oh. Uh, no idea. So let's run it again. Okay, so you can see the loss is keep decreasing, which is a good sign. If you do a trading loss, it's not decreasing, then something definitely wrong. Uh, then after you're done one epoch, uh, you can call this learning rate scheduler to change the learning rate a bit. Um, uh, actually, it's calling here. Change the, this step is get the current learning rate. Then I, I like to uh, log them into weights and bias, so I know where I am. Then uh, I will call the schedule to change the learning rate. Then I will compute my current um, uh, current uh, loss uh, and accuracy for this epoch. 
uh, then I will compute the valid, uh, accuracy on the validation side for this epoch. Uh, if this uh, validation computation is very expensive, then you don't need to do it for every epoch. Uh, maybe you can add, say, every 10 epochs, I want to do it once or something. Um, then if my current uh, validation accuracy is higher than my best, then I, I record this current model as my current best model, okay? Uh, and these two lines will record the epoch validation and accuracy to width and bias. Uh, and these lines will upgrade this uh, uh, progress bar outputs. So if we let it uh, keep running, then um, you can say I have my training accuracy and the validation accuracy, then it should keep uh, increasing. Um, so, uh, it's actually worked pretty well. So your mean dies is now 0.94 uh, for validation. So it will just keep going then um, until it's finished. So while it's keep going, if we go to um, weights and bias, uh, if you log in, uh, I need to say who I who I use. you log into account, you can say everything is progressing. So what's my accuracy? What's my loss? So everything you log in, in this code. Um, if you go into this uh, this here, you can say it's actually record your screen outputs in the weights and the bias. Um, and if you go to this overview, uh, you can say this is actually running. If you click this, it's actually will go into your computer, stop your run. So that's how you control it in your in your phone. You can look at all these websites, and then in your phone, if uh, some run doesn't make sense, you can just uh, kill it. Um, this record my uh, testing environment. Then this is my configuration parameters. Okay. So if we go to the charts, then charts is keep evolving. So you can look at this learning rate scheduler. It's like how many iteration I will reduce by, by two times or how many times, uh, depends on what you set up. So let's say uh, how many epochs we had. Almost done. So it's now getting very pretty high uh, dice ratios, okay? So we're done. Then we have our best models. We have your uh, training loss, everything record here. So if we go outside, then uh, this will finally log the test loss, okay? Uh, then we like to run this model, do an inference on one test batch. So if you run one test batch, this one will be, uh, uh, what's its size? One twenty-eight pictures. Uh, so remember, you need to put your model into evaluation mode. Then you want to put your code into this um, this PyTorch uh, scope call. So it will turn off the back prop uh, function for you. So when you run the forward prop, remember the uh, the network needs to remember a bunch of intermediate results uh, for back prop. But if you put the code into this section then it will not remember those intermediate results. 
So when you do the real model inference, uh, you don't want to remember that. So what's the eval mode? Uh, with? Uh, so uh, remember last time in the batch norm, you have some running mean and running sigma, right? So if you are training mode, those parameters will be kept updated. But in the evaluation mode, all those kind of training related up updates will be turned off. So that's why they have this evaluation mode. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so if you forget to call them, if model is still in training mode, then this will mess up your model, basically. Then um, we have the uh, logics then convert into probability, then probability is called saved as a picture uh, into this folder. So, and also we will log this picture into weights and bias. So they will be updated weights and bias as we can see them. So basically, we are done for this. Um, and if we go to weights and bias, uh, where are my... Uh, it's maybe still updating. So we have our picture uploaded to weights and bias like this. Okay, that's one test batch we have. Um, and uh, uh, this is um, uh, the test labels. Why it's not sync yet? Okay, doesn't matter. We can go to this. Uh, um, results folder. Then you can say, okay, uh, this is my best model which we saved today, and uh, we have picture for one test batch. Okay, then. Um, They have the label for that test batch. Then this is the estimate probability map. Basically the training outputs. So this neural net really do the magic, give you, you compare to the ground truth label, this neural net really uh, give you very precise segmentation. Okay. 